Hello, my name is Mike Avery from Cadence Design Systems. What I'm going to talk about in this video is one of the most dangerous and commonly made mistakes in SVA clocking, and often people overlook clocking. And it all boils down to the failure to understand this one single property here, which of course you would never write in practice. It's just a demonstration of the effect. So the property says at pos edge clock, I'm always expecting the signal CLK to be true, which intuitively may look like ah, I'm expecting that to pass all the time, because what I'm saying is every rising edge of a clock I'm expecting the clock to be one so from a pure kind of sense of syntax it might look like the correct selection to say that this will always pass however in practice it always fails for a very good reason if I were now to simulate that property so if I just select this property in the waveform click right say center source browser I can see this is the property here and we can see its status is it's always failing so throughout this entire simulation it's failing as we don't expect intuitively if we only consider the text however when we think about this in hardware terms what does this actually mean? So if I was to zoom into this area here, for example, okay, so at the pause edge clock here, if I were not sampling clock, i.e. the signal itself, any other signal, like B, for example, sampling at this rising edge, and I'm thinking in terms of how hardware works here, I'm expecting to sample the value 1 for B, i.e. the value it had before the clock arrived, not the value zero that it just changed to on this current clock. So that makes sense in hardware terms for any signal. It makes no difference if the signal you're choosing to sample is the clock in itself. Okay, so remember the SVA language is there to model hardware and that is the obvious outcome. And it's not just a oversight in SVA or an interpretation that's open to any kind of ambiguity. This is what all assertion languages do. This is a very common trait and a very common area where people don't understand this, which is why they do it wrong. Any pos edge, I'm sampling the CLK, it means its value is the what's known in the system Verilog language reference manual as pre-pwned value, the value it had before the clock arrived or before the signal changed. So think of things in terms of hardware, which is the SVA language is intended to model, not in terms of how syntax looks when it's written on a page. If we accept that, then we can maybe start to see why writing a property like this may be a bad idea. If we've got a requirement to check that signals B or C are always true, that, that expression B or C is always true. There's various ways of doing this, of course. So what I could do is use the pos edge of clock to do this. That would seem like a sensible thing to do. Or, which is what some people do, and this is a common mistake, is to use the signals in themselves. Okay, so again, from a syntax point of view, this looks like a sensible thing to do, but in reality it's not, for reasons that we're going to see. So what this says is that any time B or C change, we're going to sample the values of B and C and check that the expression B or C is true. However, the important thing, as we've just learned from the previous property we described, is that it's the pre values of B or C. So this property here, the instance name is B underscore C underscore bad. So if we go to this one here and we zoom out, this property will be evaluated any time B or C change. Okay, so here's the signals B or C. Here, the signal C changes from a one to a zero. Okay, this forces evaluation of that property with the pre pwned values, i.e. the values of B and C before they changed. So we're evaluating the expression B or C with B, where the cursor's at now, 50 nanoseconds, the value of B is one, and the value of C is evaluated to be one. The pre pwned value, the value before it changed. So remember, the reason we're evaluating this is because C has just changed to a zero, but the value for C we're using in the expression B or C is the pre pwned value. The next evaluation, however, of B or C occurs here. So the next, remember, the property is only evaluated any change on B or C. So B changes from a one to a zero. C changes from a zero to a one. Now, the value we're using in the expression B or C is we're using the value one for B and the value zero for C. The property still passes. We can see the state finished. The next time we evaluate this property is, you know, it can be any number of seconds, nanoseconds, or clock cycles later. The clock is absolutely nothing to do with this property. The property says nothing about clock. We can see here we're evaluating the property because C has just changed from a 1 to a 0 and the values we use in the expression B or C are the pre pwned values so we're using the value 0 for B and the value 1 for C so the, there's this property here BC bad still showing past. When we think of this uh, we're looking where the I'm dragging the cursor now or that, that region there all that region the value of the expression B or C is actually false, isn't it? So we're expecting you know, some indication from the tool to tell us this. Why isn't the property BC underscore bad telling me that the assertions failed? We're only going to know about this failure on the next time B or C change. So at this point here, C has changed from a 0 to a 1, and B its current value is 0 and has been for some number of nanoseconds. So the reason we're evaluating the property is because C has just risen. However, the value we're using for C is the pre point value, i.e. the value 0. So it's only here, at this time here, 90 nanoseconds that we find out that an error that occurred 
back here at 190 nanoseconds occurred. So we don't see the failure until later, the next time there is a change on B or C. Now you're probably realising about now this has some very worrying consequences. If I were to zoom in at the end of simulation time here, and if you observe this property here, BC too bad, its definition, just to remind you, is just here, at B or C. If this was the end of simulation, so where the cursor's at represents the end of simulation time, and we'll note that from this point here, C goes to a zero. The signals from that point onwards, so from 8.30 nanoseconds onwards towards the end of simulation, those signals are in a state that we're trying to detect as a failure condition, but we've not detected the failure. So let's imagine that all the way up to this point in simulation, that property, B underscore C underscore bad, had never failed yet. We've got erroneous combinations of B and C that we don't detect. So that's the danger of writing properties like this. You never know. If there is a time that you don't have another transition on, on B or C, you have no hope of detecting it fail. So for that reason, it's not a good idea. And there's a few other things you have to understand as well about properties if you were to write a property like this, all of which are not really worth the effort and the danger. You might think to yourself, well, a sensible conclusion then would be to use the pos edge of clock for everything. At the pos edge of clock, I'm detecting whether this condition is true. And you notice here, we detect the error condition on the next pos edge clock. So on this clock here, C has been driven to a zero, B was already zero, therefore at this next pos edge clock we detect that failure. And that's fine, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, however, you might ask yourself the question, what happens if I have a scenario like this, where this signal B gets driven to zero and the current value of C at that point in simulation time is also zero, and yet somehow this signal makes a transition and back to one again before the next pos edge clock. So during this point here, I have actually had a glitch in this signal which represents an error condition. However, if we write a property that says at pos edge clock B or C, what that is saying implicitly is I only care about what the values of B or C are at every pos edge clock, and I do not care, therefore, about what values they have in between. So if this represented a, something that could really happen in the design, you know, if B could go to a zero for half a cycle, then we have to just accept to ourselves we made a bad decision when we chose what the clocking expression was for this property. Now, if the signals here, B and C, are actually themselves the outputs of flip-flops and they go to the inputs of other flip-flops, which are also clocked by the signal CLK, then this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do and probably the easiest and most simplest and most efficient thing to do. However, if there are other clocks in your design or there are other combinational paths where you do care about these kind of glitches, then you obviously cannot choose at pos edge clock for B and C anymore if you care about that kind of glitch, and that is possible in your system. So that brings us to the question, okay, what do we do in that case then? We already said that we can't do at pos edge clock. We've already seen the reasons we can't do that. So what else can we do then? Well, what we have to do is use something called auxiliary code. So auxiliary code is just Verilog, system Verilog logic, which is there. And the only purpose it is there is to make it easier or more efficient for the tools to write properties. So it's not actually part of your design. It's just there to, as helper code, that's what people often call this. So what we can do then, instead of clocking the property with A or B, I can go and create my own dummy clock. So this logic signal I'm declaring here, my BC strobe, what I'm going to do with this is make an assignment to it of itself inverted after a minimum time step. So I don't necessarily need this minimum time step. All it means is it's easier to kind of interpret this and less easy to get caught out because we're forcing simulation time to advance with the statement. If we say hash zero, we're not forcing simulation time to advance and we have to consider all the other different phases and delta cycles and so on. So to avoid having to think about that, we can just do this. So we're creating a signal which is delayed by the minimum time step hash one and that signal is the inversion of itself and the important thing here is when is it triggered so this always block is triggered on any transition of B on C so what we do is we get this signal you may have noticed it earlier this signal inverts every time either B or C make a change or both for that matter and we then use that as our property clock so we will only ever evaluate this property the property's instance name is B underscore C underscore good we only evaluate that any change on the signal here which will be on that edge there this edge here, this edge here. So in SVA, when you have a property clock, it doesn't necessarily need to be a clock signal and it doesn't need to be periodic. It can be anything you choose and often you have to create your own clocks in order to work around problems such as this. Now we've got the best of both worlds now is that we detect any glitch on B or C which give us the combination we don't want to see, which is this expression being false, the expression B or C. And we don't get the problem at the end of simulation anymore. So you notice at the end of this simulation, both properties which were clocked and the one we've just shown you, the one that has a slight delay. So if I was to zoom in here further, you'll actually see this strobe is offset from the clock by that one minimum time step, which is one nanosecond in this case. And we can see this, this uh, property detects the failure that minimum time step after the transitions of signals B or C to illegal values. So to summarise what we've learned, never 
use the same signals as the property clock as you're using the expression so properties like this are bad use posedge clock where you can if all of your logic is clocked by posedge clock and all the signals going to the inputs of flip-flops clocked by posedge clock then that's the most sensible thing to use however there will be situations where you have to create your own clock with the auxiliary logic and if your clock is wrong then it doesn't matter what your property expression says everything's going to be wrong okay so make sure you don't overlook this so you've got to choose when is the most appropriate time to sample the signals that are in your property expression no one else can do this for you no tool can decide this for you only you know your design so i hope you find that um, useful you'll find more videos like this on the cadence support site which is support.cadence Com. You'll need a login to access this site and all you need for that is an email address which is a company, proper company, not a Gmail address. And in here you can just search for SVA examples and what you'll find here is a tabbed kind of player of videos and there's lots of different um, videos and you'll find a menu down the you know, description of first match operator and so on. So that's on the Cadence support site. And some of them you can also find on YouTube. So, you know, if you just use Google, search for, you know, bind SVA to VHDL, for example, just in the norm normal google.com and obviously click the video. And you'll find examples that way as well. So there's not as many videos on YouTube as there's inside the Cadence site, uh, but you'll find a few useful ones. So thanks for your attention. I uh, hope you found that useful and goodbye.